chapter 8, gene transfer, we're now looking at how the cell gains new information from outside sources. Okay? So there's certain things that we have to talk about in this section. It's Griffith's experiment, uh, horizontal gene transfer, transformation, transduction, bacteriophages, okay? lytic versus conjugation, um, plasmids, F-plasmids, transposons, oops, sorry, transposons, all of these things are going to be in, initiated within this whole entire gene transfer information. So how these microbes are gaining new information from outside sources. <coughs> okay, so the real cool thing about this is that how these guys figured out that um, microbes could gain new information from other microbes or other viruses and other sources was through Giffrey's experiment in back in 1900s. Okay. What he did was, if you look at this first one, and you looked at recombination events happen, well, this first one was really made sense. Okay, So there was a set of control experiments which led to this really neat new experiment. Okay, So he took a, a live encapsulated bacteria and injected into a mouse. So this is a very, very virulent form of a pathogen. He injected into the mouse, and of course the mouse died. Right, and he re-isolated it, like anything, to make sure it was the same, and he got the exact same type of virulent bacteria. Complete sense, right? Made complete sense. He took the exact same type, right, but took the non-encapsulated type, so the non-virulent type, and injected into the mouse, and the mouse didn't die, stayed healthy. Isolated from the actual mouse, the exact same microorganism, and he got the exact same one that did not have any capsules. So perfectly fine, right? He took the heat-killed encapsulated version, so this first one, he heat-killed it, right? Put it into the mouse, so there's no living actual microorganisms, even though it was the virulent form, and it was completely healthy, of course, right? The whole entire microbe that was virulent is now dead. <coughs> Put it into the mouse, and of course, could not isolate anything from it because all the microorganisms are dead because it was heat-killed. Okay. Now here's the cool part. So he took the heat killed one, right, plus he mixed it in with the non-virulent form, the one that did not have any capsules, mixed it together, put it into this actual um, syringe, injected the mouse, and isolated it, um, and found out the mouse died. Yeah, And so he couldn't figure out exactly why the mouse died, so when he re-isolated the microorganisms, what did he find? He found the exact actual organism, the virulent type, okay, the one from what he thought was from the first one. Even though these ones were completely heat killed, like what he did in this other experiment, and he mixed it in with a non-virulent form, he still was able to capture or get back the virulent type from it. So what in the world is happening here? How did it almost come back to life, this virulent form of it? Okay, well it did not come back to life, it was actually a gene transfer event. So what things that happen here when we talk about is this gene transfer. Okay, so this gene transfer refers to movement of genetic information between organisms. Um, recombination events is when you come recombine these genes of DNA into two different cells, from two different cells. So you're getting addition or subtraction of genetic information. Most times we talk about this in the purpose of vertical gene transfer, right? When your mother and father have you, they're giving uh, a little bit of themselves and the DNA into you, into the offspring. Okay? What we're talking about here for these microorganisms is horizontal gene transfer or this lateral gene transfer. So we're able to pass genetic information from microbes at the same generation. Okay, So they're not giving it to offspring, they're actually transferring it between each other. So what was happening here? So this was lateral gene transfer. The Griffiths experiment was a classic experiment of transformation. Okay, Transformation is one example of lateral gene transfer. Another one is transduction, which is completely different. And then conjugation, which we're going to talk about. So we'll talk about these three different types of gene transfer in prokaryotic organisms. Now transformation is one that uses only one microorganism and DNA outside of the cell. Okay. So transformation is a change in an organism's characteristics because of the transfer of genetic information. So we have a host cell and we have some outer DNA that's just free floating that gets brought into the actual cell and used. So we have naked free DNA, DNA that has been released from an organism after the cell's life and DNA is no longer incorporated into the chromosome. 
So this is broken up sheer DNA that's is there from dead cells that's been lysed and all into the environment. And then you have these competence factors. And these competence factors are released by the host, the microbe that's trying to uptake all this actual DNA. Okay. <clears throat> so what we have here is a really easy diagram to, to kind of explain everything. Here's your recipient cell, your host cell, right? Here's its chromosomal DNA. Here's the fragments or naked DNA that's outside of the actual cell. And when it releases these competence factors, it's able to uptake some of these pieces of DNA. Okay. If just by so happens, some of that DNA gets into the cell through transformation properties, it's able to actually recombine okay, fragments of it to get into the actual DNA. So this is what was happening within Griffith's experiment. He was getting genetic information to produce the capsules from the dead cells. Okay, and that information was being transferred to the non-virulent ones that could not create any um, capsules. And now all of a sudden, those non-virulent ones became virulent. They had the ability to produce capsules. These crossover events, which you don't really have to memorize at all. I just want to explain this because people had a confusion of how this was really happening. we got to remember anything that's permanent change or anything that happens has to be put into the chromosome. Okay? And what's doing it is through this RecA protein or recombination protein. And the RecA helps do this actual event and place those fragmented DNA into the chromosome. Okay. So this is a way that these cells can undergo transformation <coughs> and to get unique types of genes by allowing for this recombination event to occur. So it has a specialized enzyme to do this. Okay. Transduction is a little bit different. Transduction uses bacteriophages or viruses to transfer genetic information. So what you have here is now not only just a host cell or a recipient cell, but you also have a bacteriophage or a virus that can infect that bacteria. Now these phages are composed of nucleic acids and they're covered by a protein coat, but they have the ability to really infect these bacterial cells and transfer some of its genetic information into it. Okay, the cool thing happens with the infection process. When we talk about this infection process, the one that you want to understand is this is general transduction. Okay? General transduction looks at how these guys are changing um, associated with the infection process. So what we have here is a recipient cell here, right, or the donor cell, okay, and it gets infected by an actual phage or this virus that infects DNA, um, DNA um, infects prokaryotic cells. When it infects it, it pushes all this nucleic acid information into the actual host. And when it puts it into the host, it causes all the shearing up of all the DNA because it's hijacking all the host machinery and it produces more actual phages. So it produces all the recombination events. Everything gets repackaged up into more phages because it's trying to infect more cells. And by doing so, it grabs some of the host's DNA, okay? Shown here by these little purple kind of pieces. And by doing so, some of it gets incorporated into some of the phages. And when those phages infect new cells, you can actually get new pieces of DNA from that old cell that died into the new one and undergo that same type of replication process or recombination process that we saw previously to get incorporated into the DNA. It's really unique to see this idea that you can have an infection by a virus to give new information to these cells, but it does happen really um, relatively easy. So initially we saw one having naked DNA getting uptake by these cells. Now we're seeing phages or viruses give DNA um, to these new cells. Okay, so what's happening? So in the first step, we have bacterial phage infection by the host bacterium initiates this lytic cycle, okay? So this lytic cycle helps cause the cells to break up and to cause lysis or to die. Chromosome is broken into fragments which can be picked up and packaged into phage DNA. And then these particles or viruses are released and infect other bacterial cells, okay? So you can have one infection produces hundreds of new viruses. Each one of those viruses infect new cells. And sometimes when they uptake some of this actual host DNA, they're able to transduce or give that DNA to the next cell. So that new host acquires genes that were brought along through that virus from that previous cell. So even though these two cells never came in contact with each other, they're able to actually gain new information. Okay, the last one is conjugation. Yeah. Conjugation is having two cells put together and allowing them to exchange information. Now, oftentimes the conjugation, we see this in the form of plasmids. So we have this, in this case, one cell, 
and another cell, right? And now we get the exchange of this plasmid into this new cell. Okay, so in this case, you have to have two cells that come together, and they actually emerge together through this mating bridges. Okay, and what we have here is a lot more information being transferred in the form of plasmids. Okay, so in this case, they're using these F factors, which are fertility plasmids, that are able to basically transfer itself into the new host. Now the interesting thing is here is that you want to make an, uh, make a note of this is that the, the host okay, to the donor doesn't lose that plasmid. It's just sharing the information and this new one gains that information. So it's not like it takes the plasmid and injects it into the new one. No, no, it just actually through rolling replication process puts the DNA inside of there and replicates with the actual cell. This conjugation is genetic information is transferred from one cell to another cell. Okay. Oftentimes it has to be a very similar type of prokaryotic cell, same genus, species, to allow this to occur. And this conjugation differs really from the other mechanisms because you have to have these two cells come in contact with each other. Right? The previous two never did. They had a virus in the transduction, and the other one was uptaking just the naked DNA. So it really requires a contact between the donor and the recipient cells and can really transfer a large amount of quantity of DNA in the form of these plasmids. Okay, so you can have different plasmids associated with it. Fertility plasmids, <coughs> um, okay, that help make these pili or conjugation bridges allowing for it. Okay, you can have different types of ones that have all different processes that have it, but this is just one of the major examples associated with it that allow for this type of actual conjugation bridges to be built are these F plasmids. Okay. So you see the transfer of the F plus to F minus very easily. So F plus goes into F minus, making a new F plus cell. So you can see these bridges associated with it through these different types of microscopy of TEM. Here's a little tiny mating bridge associated with the two cells. And here's a long conjugation bridge or sex pillars associated with these two cells that we see here. So again, this pillus is a, is a, a unique pili, right, that we learned from that first section. And that allows it to make this bridge which transfers the DNA all the way to the other one. Okay, so what's the difference between the three? You want to make sure you know what is happening between each one. For example, transformation, you have a cell and naked DNA. Transduction, you have the virus and that cell. And conjugation, you have the conjugation between two cells coming together. You want to know what's actually being transferred, right? How much DNA is being produced? What are the major players involved? Okay. And how does it do it? <coughs> There's other ways that these bacteria can transfer genetic information, not just through the transformation, transduction, and conjugation methods. Okay, So you can have these things called plasmids and transposons associated with it that help give new information to these cells. Plasmids we just talked about, right? But you can have things associated with antibiotic resistance, right? Virulence plasmids are really in, in useful. Um, Unique ones such as tumor-inducing plasmids for plants. And you can have to give unique characteristics to these types of actual cells to help break down new types of carbon sources for these cells. Okay. <clears throat> so when we see these type of actual conjugation um, plasmids, you can have these R factors or resistant types. And these R factors or resistant types have multiple different types of actual um, antibiotic resistant genes that might be associated with it that can help break down or resist antibiotics. So you can imagine if you could have antibiotic resistance being transferred between same species or different types of cells, it can be really um, difficult to get rid of these guys through normal antibiotic treatments. So we can have these resistant plasmids, yeah, they can be resistant to various antibiotics or inorganic substances, right? But the most unique type that we have learned about this one is through transposons. Transposons were first in, um, isolated or looked at through somebody that was looking at corn uh, plant breeding. And they would find out that these corns would have all these different colors associated with it. And this is Barbara McClintock that was first one to look at these type of jumping genes, okay? jumping genes known as transposons. So these transposons are very unique genetic elements that can move from one place to the next. So these are mobile genetic sequences, and it can move within the chromosome or from plasmids through transposition events. Okay. They have very unique characteristics associated with it. They got these inverted repeat sequences that are characteristic of them, 
and they have a unique enzyme that allows them to pick themselves up and move to one place. So these transposases help cut out the sequence and move it into the next area. Now when we look at these type of transposons, they're just a segment of DNA. Okay. <clears throat> um, you can have a transposase gene okay, that helps jump in, but you have these inverted repeat sequences that really allow for the transposase gene to cut it and let it integrate back into the DNA. So you can imagine having these type of actual transposons being integrated at different parts of the genome. You can cause different changes in gene expression, right? You can cause certain ones to be knocked out, certain genes to not function correctly. Okay, you can change promoter sites, operator sites, and you can really cause major differences associated with these actual genetic information. Okay, not only can you do this, but you can also carry sometimes antibiotic resistance associated with it. And so by doing so, you can see how these guys can unique, uniquely get different characteristics very quickly, okay, without having to do much work, right? They're just gaining this information very, very quickly. But again, transposons are a genetic element. They're not associated with viruses or, or different types of cells. They can be housed on plasmids, okay, and shared between different sequences and definitely get into the chromosome and be permanent changes associated with it. So these transposons are very, very useful for genetic information, for moving these things. But again, they have to recombine just like what you saw with the RecA um, through the naked transformation. But again, it's a very unique way of these guys getting in. And it's a really thing that people have found out that's really useful for recombination events within these cells. Again, remember, prokaryotic cells cannot gain new information, right, through any other way besides this type of lateral gene transfer. So transposons, transduction, transformation, plasmids or conjugations play a huge role associated with getting these recombination events so these guys can gain new characteristics.